Are you ready? Yeah. All right, stand by. Yep. Up. <sighs> Super intense BB Wars, guys. BB Wars is serious business. And you know what? Very recently, we went to an airsoft event. And this was, of course, Milsim West. What is Milsim West? Milsim West is 40 continuous hours of the most intense airsofting you could ever possibly experience. You, of course, fall into two factions, NATO and Russian forces. Russian forces also have militia with them. And you can be asleep and you can be assaulted. It is some good fun out there. The question is, can anything be gleaned from this that can be useful to actual training out there? Oh, let's talk about it today. Let's talk about airsoft in general and what do I think about its application to training. Now, before we get into it, we of course have to thank the biggest sponsor of this channel. The biggest sponsor of this channel is the Sonoran Desert Institute. A big thank you to them if you're looking to get your start in gunsmithing. They are the way to go. We can't thank them enough. And of course, Zadex Computers. A big thank you to them. Gaming channel is starting soon. We've said it forever, but it will. And then of course, we can't forget what, Micah? Patreon. Patreon. Patreon is bussin'. Bussin'. It's always bussin'. And uh, Micah posts everything that I don't want to have post did. And uh, it's very upsetting for me. It gives me a lot of anxiety uh, and a little bit of eczema. But you know, it's good. We have fun. I answer questions, get in there. You, of course, get exclusive first access to a lot of our new products that we're coming out with from Onward Research. Go check it out. And of course, for this particular video, we have to thank Evike and uh, GraceShop.ru. They both provided a lot of stuff to us. The question was, why did I go as Russian forces? Well, I've served over 10 years in a, as active duty in essentially NATO, so I didn't want to be what I am in real life because I'm LARPing. It's make believe, let's just pretend. So big thank you to them. Ladies and gentlemen, I often forgotten, most certainly not by me, Hardcore Milsim LARPers. Welcome to the channel. So, Airsoft, BB Wars, is it good training? So we're gonna cut right to the chase. Right off the bat, what is the best and the worst part of airsofting? The worst part of airsofting in my mind is actually the airsofting itself. Um, in every way, I think there are a lot of bad training scars that can be had from airsofting. And let me explain it to you because in many ways, these airsoft guns can get really good. For those of you who have seen the really high quality ones, they can be one-to-one, one-to-one weight. Um, and in fact, the recoil can get very close. Hey, but inherently, there are just issues with airsofting, mostly in terms of the speed of the BB. Because the BB has to be slow enough to not kill you. It kind of makes sense. So because of that, things that could be done in airsofting could not be done in real life. So let me give you a small example here. So we have an LCT RPK from Evike, big thank you to them. Uh, what's funny about this to me is that drums in real life kind of rattle, and then the airsoft one also rattles, very realistic. In any case, we have Charlie. Charlie has two covers he needs to <laughs> run between. And uh, I'm gonna treat it as if I had a real weapon and somebody were to run from cover to cover in terms of my uh, sight placement. So we're gonna go ahead and we're gonna get this ready, make sure this is firing. Ooh, very scary BBs. All right, Charlie, go! Go! So, of course, I could have hit Charlie with this particular airsoft gun. All I would have had to have done was to lead him as you would need to lead somebody with an airsoft weapon. My problem comes into this is with a real weapon, you wouldn't lead like that. So there could be problems with sight pictures. Now, I will be very quick to mention that there is certainly application in airsofting. In terms of CQB, airsoft does have good application when you know the speed of the BB isn't as much of an issue. So certainly it's as good as UTM or simunitions in those CQB environments, but at the same time, you're still not getting that kind of perfect feel because as good as airsoft guns get, and Micah and, and many people that we've worked with have really souped up these airsoft guns to where everything feels really good, but the triggers are still not triggers and the recoil as close as it can as it can get to a real weapon is still not real recoil so i still do prefer things like utms and simunitions where you can actually just swap a bolt and fire those rounds and you have your actual weapon you have the same recoil that feels like much better training to me of course it does cost a lot more money what i will say is that if you're in a country or in a position maybe because you're too young to own a firearm stupid by the way then Airsoft certainly does have application, right? Just realize that there are limitations, both in terms of 
the shooting as well as in the manipulation of the weapon because even the way the magazines lock in on these airsoft guns is not like the real thing. So don't get too cocky there. There's nothing like real steel, but airsoft does get close. Now, I want to point something out, that being said, because I, I, I feel like I'm being too harsh. Am I being too harsh, Micah? A little too a harsh. A little too harsh. Let me say this. Airsofting is hella fun. I have a really good time going out there with the boys and shooting BBs at each other. And although there are a little bit of train scars, I put it in the same realm as paintball, but probably better because it's just easier to deal with. Airsofting is just fun, and that is okay to have fun. I don't know if you guys know that, but it, that, is, that is okay. Charlie, is it okay to have fun airsofting? No. There you have it. <laughs> Because there's nothing like pretending to be a Russian running through an open field and watching your best friend administrative results get gunned to the ground brutally by a BB gun. Gah! Gah! So it's good fun, but the question is, are, are there any good takeaways? Now, when we talk about an airsofting event like Milsom West, which is, has those continuous 40 hours of play, there are some really good lessons that you can pull. To be clear, Milsom West is not a training event. Milsom West is an airsofting event. Don't take it too seriously, but there are many good things that we can glean from it that we can possibly use in our own training. So let's talk about what those are. In many ways, when I got to Milsom West, it really reminded me of a military training event. That is, except that everybody wanted to be there by choice and nobody was sad, unlike NTC. And immediately, probably one of the first issues that everybody ran into, which is really typical of any type of gathering or military event, was comms. So one of the really good points and really good takeaways was comms. How were comms runs and what comms problems did you run into? Because many people came with bail things, some people came with other things, some people came with ATAC. The point is that there was a lot of different stuff that was running and that needed to be integrated together. That sounds like a really good training opportunity to me, and it was. So something as simple as getting everybody on the same freaks, and for those guys out there who are running encrypted comms, trying to make those work together was awesome. Not just due to trying to communicate with other people, but also in terms of communicating with each other and knowing the range of the radios as well as the amount of battery life. Because one thing that you kind of learn really quickly and the military is how quickly does your radio drain your battery? And that is a really good thing to know so that you know how many batteries you need to carry with you. This, of course, became an issue for many people, and it was, I'm doing the gabagoo, was a good training. And for many people, when comms failed, the question was, what do you do? Well, of course, pace plan, primary, alternate, contingency, emergency. It was really good training. And that also moves into, hey, me and the boys are moving. The squad is stepping off about eight to 10 guys, and we start moving through a field how do we communicate to each other? So Micah, you're out there, you haven't served, however, you've done a lot of BB wars, but we took it pretty seriously when we went out there. So something as simple as learning hand and arm signals, how was that for you? Uh, hand and arms, it was really nice because our platoon leader, Nick, yep. uh, really, Blue Gene operator. Blue Gene operator really briefed us all. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I, it was good to look, yeah. like actually apply those. But as far as comms, I was so scared to even use them because I'm like, man, I sound like an idiot. I don't know radio etiquette. I don't know any of this. But at least I was listening to people talk. You know, they call it a push to talk. And a lot of times uh, early in your military career, they call it a push to think because you press it and you're just like, uh. Now, once we were moving through the fields, what was really good is a lot of people know what a wedge formation is. A lot of people know what a file formation is. But actually moving between those two and exercising that in a large kind of squad formation or even working with two squads or three squads made it a much more dynamic event. And 100%, we can go off into Mount Rainier right back there and we could do this, right? We could go practice this on our own. But it's just a little bit more fun when you're out there and you know that there's somebody with their own little BB gats going and trying to hunt you down, adds a little bit more spiciness to it and makes it just not realistic, but makes you take it a little bit more seriously. And for that reason, I found Milsom West to be really good because again, at any time when our squad was moving, we could be attacked. There was no safe area. There is no safe zone. You could just always die. You could be taking a shit and you could die by BBs. So that was really good training there. Talked about it a lot, but one thing that a lot of people realized was that not being fit 
really sucks because when you have all of your kit on, and sure, the BB Wars loadout is gonna be a little bit lighter than a real loadout, but it is still weight on your back and weight on your body. For my military guys out there, guys who have gotten good training, you know that as you move, you move, you will take cover, you will pause, you will do sills, stop, look, listen, smell. You take a knee, you get up off that knee, you move, you take a knee, you get up off that knee. You learn really quickly that A, you're not fit because squats suck, and that two, equipment can be a very real problem for you. Mike, I know you ran into an issue with equipment. Yeah, no, I. some of my pouches just dangled in the wrong spots, gave me blisters, headache, uh, from honestly the <laughs> lack of use under nods. Uh, just suffering. It, yeah, just, just pain. pure suffering. And it, it reminds me, you know, when I was going through selection um, to become a seer specialist, one of my buddies, uh, we went on like, I think like an eight mile ruck. Uh, during training. He didn't have his Alice pack adjusted properly and it ended up uh, rubbing like a, an open sore on his back over like one day. And so we still had two weeks left of training. That thing ended up being super painful and getting super bad and infected because he kept sweating into it. The sweat would crystallize and just open it up and it sucked. And it was simply because he didn't know how to adjust his kit. So although this isn't a training event, you're still out there with your kit on and you're gonna learn what does or doesn't work just like Micah did, just like my buddy did. So that is one thing that I really loved about it. Daytime uh, was kind of a wash for me. I really didn't care for it that much because you're watching BBs fly at like 20 feet and you're like, whatever. But when we got into night, some very interesting things occurred. The reason night was so important was that living under green light, living under blue light, and actually going a full eight to 12 hours at night running nods that entire night was a real game changer for a lot of people. If you've been to a flat range, you've gone in, you've turned on your nods, I say flat ranges, we're talking about BB Wars. You turn on your nods and you shot, and you flip up your nods, you turn on your red lamp and you kind of do your stuff, cool. Is that good realistic training? I don't think so. When we got out to Milsom West, we practice full light discipline, that meant once the night set in and we put nods on, we were 100% light discipline. That meant no red lights, no lights of any kind. So things like simply drinking water become an issue. Simply finding the correct pouch become an issue. So for a lot of people, this was a really good event to get really good under nods really quick. Mike, I know you didn't have a whole lot of times under nods. Virtually none. Virtually none, and uh, then you ran a full eight hour night. And this was my first pair of nods that I had acquired a week before the event. Big things, big thank you to Discreet Ventures. Discreet Ventures. Um, and I just got thrown into the fire. I was bumping into people. I would get snagged on branches. I started to learn proximity and all that very quickly. How many times did you knock nods with somebody when you were trying to talk I to them? I ran into probably like seven people in one night. Like, stop! Yeah. So nods became really important. Now, something as simple as your nods die, you need to change your battery. This happens all the time. Can you do that at night? Sure, you can pull, unscrew the cap, but can you, do you know where your battery is located in your pack? Can somebody get that for you? So something as simple as I have my pack on, I need to change my nods, and I need to tell somebody to grab batteries out of my pack. Do they know where my batteries are? So this also came down to gear standardization. And this is a very common issue that the military runs into as well, is if I need to grab something off my buddy, a little bit of standardization can go a long way, especially when it comes to night vision. You had to see, once we got out there, people quickly realized, was their gear actually up to snuff? So does your gear glow under night vision? because some fabrics just don't work really well and are super bright in your night vision. So you learned very quickly what your gear did, what your gear didn't work. And that was really good training for a lot of people. Another simple thing to think about was light emissions. Um, people are like, okay, cool, I'm not turning on my red lamp, therefore my light emissions are zero. Well then people had a Garmin watch, but they didn't have the tactics model, so they actually couldn't turn off the light on it, and so it ended up glowing. That can be spotted for miles, easily. I, I got a radio transmission. And, you're and my radio lit up. Fucking bail fangs, dude, yeah. every time. So seeing what's going to give you way at night, it might not always be the things that you think it is. Um, one thing that I had was we had guys take camo uh, paint and smear it over any reflective surface. That's going to be vitally important, not just during the day, but also at night when it comes to any type of light that's gonna be coming in. 
easily spotable. There were some teams, whether they were running nods, but they didn't know where their gear was or whether they didn't have nods and they were running red lenses, even if they turned them on momentarily, that was like an instant beacon like in Battlefield. Like we just knew precisely where they were. And a lot of people just don't realize how bright a red light is under night vision. That can be seen for thousands of meters. And it just goes to the point, you need to have that red light discipline, or if you're gonna turn on your red lens, I know that's my military guys, throw a poncho over you, cover it. You need to stop that emission because it is so, so bright during the night. And for those guys who didn't have night vision, again, this talks about what we've always talked about, but it, it, it's not fair because night vision is super expensive, but if you don't have it, you're gonna die to people who do have it. So for those teams who didn't have night vision, if they were at such a massive disadvantage that it wasn't even fair at that point. We could walk right up to them and just BB wars them to death. And it, it just wasn't fair. But it was also really good training because you got really good at very quickly identifying who did and didn't have nods. Which also brings us to something as simple as aiming. When you aimed, did you use your IR laser or did you not? Most people learn to not use their IR laser because that thing would give you away so damn quick. It is so bright, especially for people running modern night vision. It was just a really bad idea. And Dude, don't that thing should not even. It's not even fair. That, so, oh my god. So you can come in here. Uh, we're not paid by these guys or anything like that. This is an IRA Micro uh, MH25, just a little thermal unit. And um, what do you want to say about it, Micah? It's literally a like not a game changer is an understatement. So, like we said before, um, there's nothing fair about how you fight. And I know we're talking about BB wars, but again, we're trying to get the translation going across. But thermals 100% made everything um, unfair. Uh, as we can see from this footage that we're going to pop up right here, because you can actually record through this unit. I ended up running it as a standalone. That's not how I would typically run it, but that was simply due to the ranges that we were shooting with our BB gats. I really didn't need any magnification on it or anything like that. But I was easily spotting people at a thousand meters plus. So when it comes to actually conducting an ambush, this thing made it stupid easy. So once we started using this, and uh, I mean, for people who've used thermal, you know it already, but it, it literally dictated how we would conduct our ambushes, how we conduct our patrols, because we could easily spot sentries, we could easily spot anyone. So night vision is really good. Uh, I was running uh, current gen, gen three PVS 31 alphas, which are uh, current military issue in use. And these are awesome, they're, they're very good, but uh, there was no illumination. We, it was a completely cloudy, mostly raining event. Uh, it's very hard to see stuff under night vision, even with as good as night vision can be. With thermal, it was just stupid easy. So in many cases, uh, we were able to spot sentries, take them out, um, spot people trying to flank on us, take them out, uh, simply by me relaying their positions uh, with my thermal unit, because it also gives me exact bearings uh, via a co an internal compass. So it was very much so cheating. In one case, and you can see the video right here, we began to move on the main NATO base, and uh, they had one or two guys maybe with PVS-7s, and uh, it, you can see from the footage, I could see them in the tree line from a solid 400 away. We kind of knew where their position was because we could see the glow from one of fire. Great job on that one. It was raining, so they got a little snivelly, so they had to start a fire. Uh, don't start a fire at night if you're fighting against people with night vision. That's a terrible idea. I know it's BB Wars, but in any case, it was simple. We, were, it, we wanted to see how close we could get. And as you can see, um, I'm continually like raising my gun. I'm like, I feel like we're way too close because I, I think of it in terms of a real gun because we got to within about 15 feet of these guys. You can see administrative results was right in front of me. And uh, we just ended up taking the shots, uh, took out everybody at the fire and completely decimated the base, um, completely wiped them out. Um, it was just unfair. And that was due to a combination of night vision and thermals of which they had very few. And the fact that they posted very minimal security and had very poor light discipline. Again, lessons learned for many people in many different aspects. And to be clear, um, Blue Gene Operator actually committed war crimes by shooting people in their sleep after they tried to surrender. Don't wanna talk about it, a little bit of PTSD. So one really good thing that came up was how do we communicate under night vision? Was it hand and arm signals? Was it use of IR light? Was it use of radio transmissions? What do we do when we get close? Because as you know, the focal length on uh, nods are a little bit thin and narrow, so it can be hard at times to see. This came down to training. This came down to many things, which we will talk about in future videos. But the point is, these are important things to figure out 
and that can be figured out in a uh, fun little BB Wars game like this. I don't want to harp on it too much other than to say that night vision thermals are kind of going to be the future in many ways. Nothing about the price, but the capabilities is fair, um, but nobody cares. So you'll probably have to get used to them at some point, and that's just the way the conflict goes. I'm sorry, guys. It just kind of sucks. Suffering. Um, another thing that was really important to learn was to suffer because lucky for us, we had really bad weather there, which is perfect. That's what I wanna see. We had constant rain, constant near freezing temperatures, and what this made people realize is that one, they were completely unprepared in terms of their clothing, in terms of their boots. Micah, were your boots adequate for the weather? No, they were soaked. They said Gore-Tex, but... Nope. No. Nope. Friendship ended with Gore-Tex. <laughs> Friendship ended with Gore-Tex. So I ended up going with leather that was, um, I treated my boots with snow seal and they lasted the entire time through. Of course, uh, if you haven't used, you will learn to use merino wool socks and you will learn to love them because they are the only way to go. But the point was, is that for many people who hadn't, they had to learn to just suffer through the weather. Uh, we didn't make giant fires at night. We didn't try to get warm at night. We simply went and patrolled as a squad and went in as our little Russian death squad and all that kind of stuff. Why that's good is it's good to get used to that feeling of being wet, of being cold, but kind of warm enough to still function because you're moving. Um, these are good things to get used to. The fight typically isn't going to happen at a time when it is convenient. So um, to quote a dumb term that we use all the time, uh, get comfortable being uncomfortable. And this was a great opportunity to do so even though it was simply BB Wars. You can take, make it as good or as bad as you want to. Uh, because in our case, there's a point at, in our AO, area of operation, BB Wars, where we had like a solid 700 meters of open field. And I have a little video right here. And you can see that it, it's just completely open and we're just walking in it. And that's not realistic, right? Because in real life, uh, a weapon like this, if it were real, an AK-105, could easily make a five, 600 meter shot and could put us straight into the dirt. So in reality, we'd want to take that route way differently. We'd want to use micro terrain, actually navigate, belly crawl, use what we can and move at times that make sense. How much you're going to get out of an airsoft event like Milsom West is completely predicated upon you about how you as a squad, as a team handle it, how seriously you take it, and how much fun you have with it. Because no matter what, have fun doing this. But the point is there's a lot of good things to glean from it. So before I go, I do want to talk a little bit about some of the kit that we use. We used from Evike, the LCT uh, SR3M. Ran semi-okay, I would probably go with the 105. We use the Onward Research Recce Rig, which is our rig. Uh, it's pretty, uh, pretty awesome. And, and I use a sword dump pouch. And of course, I was using my normal uh, three-day assault pack from Mystery Ranch as well as ATAX from uh, Gray Shop. So a big thank you to them for sponsoring that. Again, we just wanted to do something a little bit fun. Uh, point is I had a great time and uh, for a lot of the people that I typically associate with, it was a really good event to be able to kind of get them closer to a level that I needed them at uh, while also having fun. So in conclusion, should you BB Wars? I think so. I think it's really fun, and I also think there are a lot of great things to pull from it. So for my BB Wars guys, keep being cool. For my gun guys, get out there and do a little bit of airsofting. It's actually a lot of fun, and there are some good things to pull out of it. And let's bridge that community, because a lot of the BB Wars guys that I talked to, uh, if they were of age, owned guns, and said, hey, uh, I watched channels and channels like yours, and it got me into airsoft because I was too young to own a gun, and then once I was old enough, I bought a gun, and I love this stuff now cool. And for guys who are too young to own guns, they're like, Hey, I watch your channel. I love it. I can't own a gun yet. So I airsoft and I have an airsoft gun. I'm like, cool. That's awesome. Keep training, keep getting out there because the point is we're going to live and we're going to die based on how we hold together as a community. Let's be inclusive and not exclusive. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for watching. Get out there, have fun, have a good time, make this community stronger. And I've got nothing else for you. It's funny you say that. I started out as an airsofter way before. Did you really? I, like, I, literally, I didn't give a shit about guns until airsoft became my life, pretty much. You know what I mean? Look at that. My camera guy, Micah Mayfield, started in airsofting, and now he is a savage shooter and just shoots all the time and helps grow the community, all because of airsoft. Inclusiveness. That's my final message to you guys. Nothing more. Get out there and have fun.